My name is Jordan Garcia. I'm a staff engineer at Optimizely, and we are the uh, world's largest A-B testing tool. So I'm a big fan of ping pong and functional programming. I'm sure you'll see that throughout this talk. So in this talk, we'll be programming Tetris. And we'll be using the tech stack Immutable.js, Flux using the implementation Nuclear.js, and React. So before we start, uh, let's, let's get some hands up. Who here has used or heard of Flux? OK. What about React? Awesome. So the beginning of the talk, we'll overview the tech stack. And it seems like a good majority are familiar with the technologies involved. So we'll go through that pretty quickly. <clears throat> then we will discuss game architecture in React and Flux in particular. Uh, there's a lot of principles in React that guide the way you want to do data modeling within your game. And the final section of this will be a bit of live coding. Uh, hopefully, I won't mess up too much. <laughs> so Mutable.js. Mutable.js is a data structure library for JavaScript that implements immutable versions of a lot of common data structures, like objects and arrays. Uh, so there's an immutable version for objects, which is the immutable map. And there is an immutable version of arrays, which is the immutable list. Like the name suggests, immutable JS, all operations are immutable. So what that means is if I have a map, foo with the value bar, and then I call set on that map, instead of mutating that map in place, it instead returns a new map a copy, per se. And immutable is nice because it handles a lot of the kind of memory management dealing with actually making this new representation. So it doesn't actually do a deep clone on it and return you a new copy. Um, so th this is very nice for a lot of reasons. And we'll see that throughout the talk. But the biggest one in my mind is understandability. Being able to understand that this is the value of something and no matter what happens outside of the context of this, that value isn't going to change. Or me changing that value in a function isn't going to affect things outside of my function. We have a quality by value. And this is huge. Um, in JavaScript, this only exists for the primitives of number, Boolean, string. But for things like objects and arrays, you don't actually have a quality by value. And if you want to achieve this, it can be very expensive. Angular uses a uh, very recursive walking of a data structure to actually do <clears throat> deep equality. But with Immutable, we can, see, we can create two maps that are equal by value, <clears throat> and then using the Immutable is function, know that they're equal. And this is really important. It's, it's almost foundational to the Flux framework that we'll be using throughout this talk, Nuclear.js. Because in Nuclear, we need to know Here's a large map. Does it equal this other large map? And the reason why we need to know is we need to know, has anything changed since the last time we've evaluated? And if it has, we need to update the UI. So having the ability to have a quality by value goes such a long way in being able to architect this game in the way we want to architect it, and applications in general. So why use immutability? Immutability isn't free. There's a memory overhead to using this library. There's a conceptual overhead for developers to understand you know, a new API. For us, it was three things. The first is safety. So having the guarantee that no matter what I do in this function or no matter what's happening outside of this function, this data structure is going to be this value, and nothing can change that. That adds a lot of predictability to your code in a way that, at scale, reduces complexity greatly. It's performant. And the reason why it's performant in our case is we're leveraging the deep equality checks of immutable JS. So with immutable, if you have two maps that are equal, then we can know in constant time if those two maps are equal. We don't have to reevaluate. We don't have to traverse the object every time we want to know equality. And last is reusability. Because you're dealing with immutable data structures, 
you're forced to write functions in a pure way. So a clear input gives you a clear output. And if you end up writing the majority of the functions in your code base like this, they're infinitely reusable because they have no side effects and they don't rely on outside state. The next piece of technology we'll be using is NuclearJS. NuclearJS is an implementation of Flux architecture that we built at Optimizely. It's our third iteration on Flux, and it's the one we chose to open source. And while building immutable J or while building nuclear JS, I actually used the game Tetris as a way to vet the framework. So I felt like if I can't implement Tetris in this, it shouldn't be used at Optimizely. Uh, so the overview of nuclear JS, it's it's a flux framework. Uh, for those familiar with Redux, it's very similar to Redux. I'm actually really glad Redux exists because it's very easy to talk about nuclear JS now. Um, so all of your application state is held in one large immutable map. Uh, instead of reducers, you have stores, which is, this was before reducers were a thing. Um, and a store controls a certain domain of your application state, and it ha defines an initial state and any handlers. Uh, so when you dispatch an action in the flux paradigm, a store handles that action by returning a new store state. Dispatching actions is the only way to update your app state. And this is a pretty fundamental concept of Flux. The idea is you aren't distributing pieces of your system that know how to update the state of your application. Instead, you centralize that in one place and say, if you want to add a user, you have to dispatch an add user action. And the user store is responsible for implementing the logic to know how to update your app state. And the last part about nuclear is how we do subscriptions. So building a Flux framework is great, but if you have no way to get the data into a UI framework, then it's not quite useful. In Nuclear.js, we use a functional lens concept called getters that allow you to observe and subscribe to any state that you have in your application state or any derived state. And we'll see examples of that. <coughs> So I'm sure this is very small. Uh, this is uh, an example of a store in nuclear. So we define an item store. And much like a React component, we have a get initial state function. And what this does is it defines the initial value for this part of your application state. So for items, we have an immutable list of two items. And then in the initialize function, we define a handler. So when we get the action dispatch add item, we put a handler function that takes the current state and the payload of that action and returns the new state. So handler functions in Nuclear.js are pure functions that take the current state of the store and the action and return a new state. And once we have a store registered, we can evaluate our application state. So the initial state of our application looks like this. We have a, a map of items and then a list of items. <clears throat> we dispatch actions in Nuclear to update the application state. So the API looks like this. We dispatch add item and we give an item of type food it's broccoli, it costs $2.99. And then immediately, if we evaluate our application state, we can see that the broccoli item was added. The final part to nuclear is the concept of getters. So a getter can exist in two forms. It can exist as a key path into your application state map. So in this case, items. So as you saw before, our application state is a map that has the key items. If we evaluate the array items, we get back a subsection of our application state. The second, probably more interesting form of getters is one where we do an immutable transformation. 
So if you're familiar with Angular and Angular style dependency injection, this will probably look familiar. So we have a total getter. And the concept behind this getter is we want to take all the items in the item store and sum up their price into a total. So we declare the dependency of items, and then we define a function that takes the item list and reduces the price to get the total. And what's really cool about this is we now have this addressable unit, or the way I like to think about it is a getter represents a question that we want to ask our application. What is the total price of all the items in my application? And with a getter, we can answer that question immediately, or we can observe it and bind it to a UI component. So the code here is a React class, and we use the React mixin on nuclear. And we say, get data bindings. And we use a getter here, the board. And then anytime the board changes, or you can think of this as the items getter, anytime the items change, this component will get re-rendered. So that means you don't actually have to implement the imperative logic that says, observe this data model, and anytime it updates, change these things in my UI. Instead, all you do is create a data model in Nuclear. You create a getter that points to whatever application state you want, and then you hook it up to a component. And anytime you do a dispatch that would change that application state, your component re-renders. And we'll go into deeper examples of this in Tetris. Is everyone with me up until this point? Any questions? Cool. So now that we have an overview of the technologies that, that we'll be using, let's talk about Tetris and how we'll design Tetris. So in Tetris, you have a board. It's a 10 by 22 grid. There are seven different piece types, and forming a contiguous horizontal line clears the line and adds to your score. It's a very simple classic game and is actually quite easy to build if you choose the right abstractions. So let's talk about our data models first. In Tetris, a piece is called a tetramino, and there are seven different tetraminos. The way we'll identify them is with a single character, so like I, J, L, T, and the idea is that these characters kind of look like the shape. So for this, we'll create a data-only definition of a tetramino. So we'll define the spawn position. So when that piece comes on the board, where is it located? And we'll define the structure. And the structure does a few things. It tells you the shape of the piece. So this structure of x, y coordinates is 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, and 3, 0. It's a horizontal 4 by 1 line. It's a good piece in Tetris. By defining two entries in structure, it defines what the rotation of that piece is. What is the translation when you rotate it? So when you're at rotation 0, you get the horizontal version. When you're at rotation one, you get the vertical version. Now that we have a definition, we can use that definition to power one of the two key data models in Tetris, which is the piece. And the piece data structure is simply type, which corresponds to the character, like I, a rotation, which corresponds to an index in the structure array, so if rotation 0 means you get the original horizontal line, and it defines a position. And that position is the actual coordinates that that piece exists on the board. The other data model in Tetris is the board. It's a pretty simple data structure that is actually just a primitive type of a, a immutable list. Or you can also think about it as an array, a 2D array. So it's a list of lists that represents an x, y coordinate plane. So in this data structure, 
The null value represents nothing at that square. And then a character value of i or l or j represents a block of that piece type existing at that coordinate. So in this example, we have a th four by three grid, <laughs> and there are pieces at one, two, 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 three, one, and three, two. So this is all pretty simple so far. We actually haven't gotten into much of React or Immutable that much, or Flux. We've simply defined our data models. So now let's introduce a React component to this piece, and it's actually going to be the only React component we use and that is the board component. So for a board data structure, the board component will render a board. So it renders a, a square of size, you know, width and height, and for whatever pieces exist on that board, it renders a block. It's a very, very simple React component. And the beauty of React here in Tetris, or in game building, is we simply implement one function that says, Given a board, this is the DOM that I give you, the render function. And then any time our state changes, React will handle re-rendering the DOM. So we don't have to say, when this piece is here and then it moves down, move these DOM nodes down one. Instead, we just define a function that accounts for all possibilities in our 2D plane and renders a board. So an example of the board component is actually in this presentation deck. Um, this is using Spectacle, which is a slideshow library written in React. And these boards here are using the board component. So we have a series of helper functions for Tetris. We have our data models. Now we need things that actually operate on our data models. Because our data models are pure data structures, they're not objects or classes, uh, there are no methods on them. So we need to define helper methods. And this is where the idea of pure functions really come into play. So the first helper method I'll introduce is the add piece to board method. And it takes a piece and a board and returns a new board. And it does it all immutably. So now we have this library function that can take a piece, put it on a board. And the result at the bottom is that we have an empty board we create a piece, we add the piece to the board, which returns us a new board, and we have it rendered uh, in the bottom right. <clears throat> the next function is move. So given a piece and a vector, a delta x, delta y array, it returns us a new piece moved by that vector. This is a very naive implementation. It doesn't check for anything. It doesn't check any you know, out of bounds logic or collision logic. It's simply, here's a piece. It's at position one, three. Move it down one, so zero, negative one. And then it's at position one, two. So as you can see here, we have the original piece at one, three. And it's moved down to one, two. Very much like move, we have rotate takes a piece, takes a, uh, a rotation diff is what I call it in code. Uh, so how many times does it get rotated? And then it returns to you a new piece. So we now have uh, a piece, we put it on the board, we take that piece, we rotate it, and put it on a new board. And you can see the result. And this is all done immutably. So we're not mutating one board, we're not mutating one piece. We're getting a board and a piece and returning a new board. We're getting a piece and returning a new piece. And while it may seem arduous to talk about, it leads to great reusability of these functions. And it means when you build out a game or an application like this, you're actually building out a library of functions to solve a problem, which is what great reusability in software design really is. We have the clear lines function. So given a board, check if there are any lines on the board, and then return to me a new board with the lines cleared. So in this example, we have lines at uh, y values 0 and 2, and it returns us a new board with those 
blocks removed. And the last helper function that we'll be using throughout this talk is isValidPosition. And this is pretty important because our move and rotate functions don't have uh, any collision checking or out of bounds checking. So this function takes a piece and a board and returns to true or false if that piece is in a valid position. So we've gone over our helper methods. And what they've done is they've abstracted the complex application logic with pure functions. From everything I've showed you so far of the data models of board and piece and helpers like move and rotate and add piece to board, we're building a library or a vernacular of solutions around Tetris, around the domain of Tetris. But we haven't used React yet. We haven't used Nuclear yet. We haven't used any framework besides Mutable.js. We're solving these problems in a way that is agnostic to how we want to use them. And that's really important if you want to create great libraries. These functions are incredibly easy to test. The slides themselves are almost tests because you can easily see, given the board and a piece, and I move it down one, does it render the correct board? There's simply an input and an output. And any time that you have functions that are pure, that take an input and return an output, testing them is trivial. You don't have to deal with stubbing. You don't have to deal with mocking any dependencies or mocking the network or stubbing your UI components. It's simply a function that you assert returns the proper thing. And they're composable. Because they have no side effects, because they don't rely on outside state, they can be chained together. They can be transformed. They can be mutated. It doesn't matter how you use these functions because they're, they're doing math. So with these helpers, we've now built a solid foundation to actually build Tetris. And we've done so without being too opinionated about the tools we'll use. Also, they're, they're mutable. So now that we have our data model and our functions, we need to build a runtime. So right now, we, we don't actually have a game. We have a library to build a game. So how do we go about building the game? When building a runtime, the primary thing you should be thinking about is probably state, because that's essentially all a runtime is. So we'll be using Nuclear.js and a game store in Nuclear to, to keep track of our state. And the two big pieces of state that we'll have are the board and the piece that the user is controlling. And when going through this exercise of thinking about state, I think it's important to keep this as a top priority, whether it's game design or application design or building a website. The less state that you can have that represents all the ideas that you want to represent, the less complex your application will be, the less duplication you'll have, and the simpler it is to reason about. So really sitting down and understanding the problem and the domain and figuring out for my requirements, what is the minimal amount of state necessary to solve this problem goes a long way in building a clean foundation for whatever it is you're building. So we have the idea of state, but we need to interact with the user. We need to handle the user's input. And the way we'll you do this is through flux. So anytime the user does an action, but they move up, move down, left, right, the controls in Tetris are very simple. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'll only be using the arrow keys. Anytime a user interacts with the game via an arrow key, we'll dispatch a message into the Flux system. And then the game store will respond to that message. So for move right, we expect the game store to move the, the active piece right one, or for move left, to move left. And these dispatches causes the app state to update. And like flux systems, an app state update will cause the UI to re-render. 
So because we've set up a React component that subscribes <laughs> to the application state, then any time that application state changes, React will re-render. So let's start coding. Uh, any questions at this point, I'd be happy to take. No? OK. Can everyone read this? Cool. So this is, this is what we have. We have Tetris. Um, it doesn't really do anything right now. I've implemented the board component that we've seen in the slide deck. And that board component is connected to our game store. But our game store doesn't really have anything in it right now. And as you can see, as I interact with the page, if I press up, it tries to rotate. If I press left, it dispatches a left. If I press right, it dispatches right. And if I press down, it does two things. It dispatches a move down, and it also dispatches a spawn piece because there's no piece on the board. And the way we hook this up to the React component is actually very simple. Let's just start from the top. This is the main file. This is the file that's the build target of Webpack running in the background. We add the event listener for key down, and we say handle key down. Mm -hmm. And it goes to that switch statement that I previously showed. And then we render the game component on the main element. And that's, that's it. The game component is a component that subscribes to the application state via the nuclear React mixin. It says, give me the state of the board, and then give that state to the board component. So anytime the board changes, we'll call the render function, which calls create board component with the board. So I've implemented a single debug function, which can show us the state of the board. It's called debug board. So right now, there's nothing on it. And if I spawn a piece, there's nothing on it. So let's implement spawn piece. So the file we're looking at right now is the game store. It contains two methods, get initial state which defines the initial state of our game. We have three pieces of state. We have the active piece, which in the beginning is nothing. We have the flag, is over, because we need to know when the game is over. And we have the board, which initially is an empty board of width and height. In the initialize method, we define how we'll handle each action that's dispatched. So as you saw in the browser, when we press up, it dispatches rotate. It's up to the game store to handle that. So let's look at that. Let's look at the spawn piece action first. So when spawn piece happens, we can see it gets dispatched with an object where the type is J. So that's this piece. And what should happen is that there should be a piece of shape J put on the board. And then that piece should be able to be rotated, moved, whatever. What's really happening is nothing. We're taking the current game state and returning the same state. Uh, so it's pretty clear that nothing should happen. So what we want to do is we want to use our helpers and our data structures here to return the correct state. So for spawning a piece, we want to take the piece, figure out where it should be put on the board, and then set that piece as the active piece in the game. So let's do that. And for the sake of coding, I'll be using a few ES6 features like const and let. Um, just think of them as vars. Pretty much the same. So let's pull out the board and the active piece, 
So it's um, so we're given the piece type. Let's create a piece of that type. We'll give it a rotation initially of zero because it's an initial state. And we'll give it the position of the spawn position. So we have all of our tetraminos defined here. So for J, we have a spawn position of 320. So we'll simply reference that definition here. And last, we return a new state. So because stores use immutable JS, we'll take the current state of the store and we'll call the set method, which will return us a new map with the piece active piece set to the piece we just created. So let's see if this works. So if I press down and spawn piece, we now have a piece on the board. But we can't do anything with that piece yet because we haven't implemented the action handlers to down or rotate or left mm -hmm. or right. So let's continue. Also, if anyone has any questions or wants to comment, uh, feel free. Uh, it can be very free form. So now let's implement the move down method. Right now, it does the same as the other methods in the store and does nothing. So the logic we want here is, if there's an active piece on the board, move that piece down and then set that as the new active piece. So we'll use our helper method, move. So we'll say the moved piece is the active piece and we'll early return if there's no active piece. Uh, it's the active piece moved down by one, so the vector is zero, negative one. And then we'll return state.set active piece moved piece. So now when we move down, it moves the piece down. So we have a problem. Because our move method is really dumb and naive, it doesn't check that we're now out of bounds and it loops around. Um, this is not intended, so we need to add checks against this. So what we can do is we can use the helper is valid position to check first, is this piece in a valid position before we set it on the board? So we can say if helpers.is active position, that's not it is valid position, moved piece, board, return this, else return state. Let's see if that worked. Let's see if that worked. It did, but now we have no other piece. We're simply moving it down and nothing happens. The mechanism in which spawn piece is dispatched, so how does Tetris know I need to spawn a new piece? And the way we'll represent that is by saying if the active piece right now is null, spawn a new piece. Well, what we've done is instead we've said if it's a valid position, move it down one. If it's not a valid position, just return the current state of the game. So when it hits the bottom, it can't move it down one, so it returns the current state of the game, which has active piece set. So let's change that. We'll need to do two things. We'll need to lock the piece on the board using the add piece to board helper method, and then we'll need to null out the active piece. So I say, the new board is helpers.add piece to board, and we'll add the active piece and the board. 
And then we'll return the state and set the board to the new board and the active piece to null. Let's see if that works. It did. But we can't move left or right, which is a problem. So let's implement that. Much like move down, moving left or moving right will follow the same logic. Try to move it over one. If it's valid, set that as the active piece. If it's not, then just return the current state. Because if you're against a wall and you keep trying to move left, nothing should happen. So we'll just copy some of the above function. And we'll move the piece for left. We'll move it negative 1 over and 0 in the y direction. And we'll say if it's valid, return that as the new piece. Otherwise, return state. Let's see if this works. It does, and it doesn't go to the other side, which is good. We can do the very same thing for right, um, but we can actually refactor this into a, a bit drier method. So we can just use a... Um, more generic move method that takes a vector instead of a specific negative one over to the left or plus one over to the right. So it takes a vector and does this. And then we can simply call move left as move state negative one, zero. And this is a good example of how composing pure functions together leads to really good reusability, because we're able to compose this action. So now we can move left, we can move right, and we actually play the game. Sort of. So let's implement rotate. And rotate's a tricky one. There's a, there's a lot of different things to rotate that aren't as simple as they seem. But let's implement the simple version. <coughs> So if you recall, we have a nice helper method for this, which is rotate. So we'll just copy some more code. So what we can do is we can say rotated piece is helpers.rotate. Oh, this is totally the wrong function. Here we go. We can say the rotated piece is the active piece rotated by the rotation diff. And then we'll say if the rotated piece is valid, set it on the board. Cool. Oh, that, that's not cool. Why isn't right working? Did I mess up right? Hope not. Yeah, right moves left. Should move right. So we can move left, right, we can rotate. Cool, we, we have almost Tetris. There's, a, so there's some tricky things to rotate though, um, and a lot of it revolves around um, like boundaries. So if I rotate here, it should rotate. There's nothing stopping me. Um, but what's really happening is it's rotating with the, the vertex of the piece at position like eight, five or eight, six. And when I rotate, it's trying to put the, the bottom block out of bounds. So that's, that's an invalid state. It doesn't allow that. So it returns the current state of the game. Um, but we, what we'd actually like to do is we'd actually like to massage this a little and say, well, if you try to rotate and you can't, like try to rotate and move over one and see if you can rotate. And if you can do that, then that seems fine. So we'll actually use the same functions that we've been using to accomplish this in a very kind of clever way, which I already have down here. This is the uh, hidden code. I'll just uncomment that. And I'll, I'll move this up. Let's see, where does this go? 
So what we do is we define a series of translations of movements. So we first try to do it at its original position. And if that doesn't work, let's move it up one and try to rotate. If that doesn't work, let's move it up two. If that doesn't work, let's move it right one. Um, so we go through this list of translations until we find one that's valid. And if none are valid, then we determine you can't rotate the piece. So what we do is we say for each one of these translations, first move the piece. And we, we need to put back our rotate. And if that is valid, return the piece on the board. And if all fails, return the same game state you had. Let's see if this works. Hmm, should. So we get to play spot the bug, which is a lot more fun for you than it is for me. Oh, that does work. Maybe there's no bug at all. <laughs> so, I mean, this is an example, though, of because we're using pure functions and because we don't have a, a board object that has the state of the board on it that's linked to a UI that anytime you change updates the UI, because we have this as pure functions, we can be exploratory about our actions. We can say, try this. If it works, that's the new state. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because we haven't made any mutations. And what really happens is this really nice pattern emerges where almost every action, whether it's moving or rotating or going up or you can't go up, going down, is basically saying, try it first. If it's a valid position, then go with it. If it's not a valid position, then do nothing. So let's, let's play the game. We have Tetris. Let's, let's do it. Um, I have a soft drop function, but it's not implemented. So the last thing we need to implement is clearing the lines. Um, clearly that does not work, and it's very crucial to the game, otherwise you'll die really quickly. So the point at which Tetris clears the lines is actually when you move down. So when you move down and the piece is atop another piece or atop the floor, it locks it in place. So at that point, we want to check, are there any lines? If so, remove them from the board. So let's look in our down function. In this else block, we say, <coughs> You can't move down one, so lock the piece on the board. So we can actually use our helper clear lines to do this in a very functional way. We can simply just put helpers clear lines. Because add piece to board returns us a new board, and because clear lines accepts a board and returns a board, we haven't changed any of the agreements between these functions. We simply added another function around this. Go play some more. That doesn't work. What is that? I think we'll get one this turn. Yeah. And it clears. <laughs> okay, so this game works, it's Tetris. Uh, the, the final thing is you shouldn't have to press down every time you want to actually move down. There should probably be a game tick. So let's implement that. So in our down function, this is what it actually looks like. When you press the down button, we dispatch the move down action. If you should spawn a piece, we dispatch the spawn piece 
And this line, the timeout, is a very small lightweight mechanism that basically does a fancy set interval. So it says for a particular timeout, cue another timeout. So after one second, go down, and then cue up another down action in one second. Uh, the reason why it's not simply a set interval is there are cases where we want to cancel the timeout. Um, so when you press down, that should reset the timeout because you could be in a state where it's about to tick, you press down, it ticks, you go down twice, and we don't want that. So the, the timeout class is a simple API. It has queue and reset. So we'll queue another uh, down after. So when you start the game, I have down. And we have pretty much Tetris. Are there any questions up until this point? I've gone through a lot of code. Um, if you'd like to see any in particular or ask any questions about the data model, immutable, now's the time. You guys just understand it all. It's awesome. So that's Tetris. Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, kind of the immut immutability. So like how whenever you add a new active piece or mm -hmm. when you move it, how it knows that that's actually the same piece that just got moved and it doesn't add another piece to the board. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and something uh, didn't quite go over. So if you recall in the slides, we have the concept of getters. And getters allow you to take disparate parts of your application state and transform them together. Um, so one of the really nice things about Flux is debugging and it's great. So we can open up any of these dispatches and see the state of the game. So in the game state, we have the three things we defined in our game store. We have the active piece and the board. So the board is simply an array of arrays or a list of lists, and the active piece is the active piece. So when we're changing the active piece, when we're moving it down, we're actually replacing the active piece in the game data structure, in the game store. Um, so by definition, there can never be multiple active pieces at once. And it's not until the piece gets to the bottom where we lock it into the board and add it to the board. Um, but what wasn't shown is these two things, the active piece and the board, get combined into a single board before it gets to the UI. And the reason is the board component doesn't care what piece is active and what's on the board already. The board component simply cares about a 10 by 22 grid and what block is in what square. So this is an example of our board bidder. And if you recall, it's used in the game component. So we set up a data binding between our component and the game board getter. And we say anytime the board getter changes, re-render. And the board getter depends on two things. It depends on the active piece and the board. And if there's an active piece, it returns to us a new board with the piece added to it. So the, the view of the world that the UI sees is completely different than the view of the world that your store sees. And this is intentional, because you don't want a strong coupling between your application state and your UI. Your UI should have a contract with the application state. In a lot of cases, especially in, in web applications, your UI wants a data structure that looks completely different than maybe what your REST API returns, or what you're storing in Flux. Your UI usually has concerns over you know, how it wants to display items and the relationships between those items rather than what the API looks like. So by using a functional transformation or a getter for the board, we're able to give the UI exactly the data structure it needs while maintaining a very simplistic representation under the hood in Flux and having those two systems not know about each other. Did that answer your question? Yes? In terms of reusability, you'd be able to use the bumper functions and just the data model side to actually create a computer player and then just have the new be able to reuse that piece completely. Mm -hmm. uh, like in a game of chess, it makes more sense to yeah. very easily. Yeah, that's a very good point. I've, uh, I've wanted to actually build a AI for this. Um, 
And that's something where, you know, I've designed games in the past where I didn't think about this in the beginning. I didn't think about, you know, how does a computer or how does an artificial player interact with the game? In a lot of ways, that API or that interface should be very similar to how a user interacts with the game. And being able to expose a library of helper functions and expose you know, a dispatch mechanism where they're dispatching the same messages that a user would press a key would dispatch gives you that parity. Anything else? So what happens when they stack up? Did we, did you get that done? So we haven't implemented the, um, the game over logic. We can do that really quickly. Let's go, let's go for it. So what happens is when we spawn the piece, if the piece spawns in an invalid position, the game is over. So if you go back to our game store and we look at the spawn piece, then it's pretty simple. What we can do is we can say if helpers.is valid position and whoops. then we actually run, want to return a different state. We want to return state.set is over to true. And um, we'll set the active piece as well. We don't have to set the active piece here, but what it will do is it will show the piece on the board, basically overlapping another piece. So let's see what this looks like. Um, also, this alone doesn't solve our problem because there's nothing checking if the game is over, don't spawn another piece. Which is, mm -hmm. So if we go in our actions, we can say um, if, and so in other examples in this code base, we've seen the use of getters. Um, it may seem complicated, but getters in their simplest form are just key paths into our state array or state map. Um, so as you can see, if we look at game dot is over, that's actually what we want. So we can say evaluate game is over. If it's over, simply no op. We can say like console.log, it's over. So let's try to die. It sounded really morbid. That's a good piece. That's a good piece. <laughs> it's over. Any other feature requests? That's awesome. Yeah. So if that happens, I assume you can just start from the base game flow, start over. And yeah. Like a, like a pre, a pre like a, yeah. yeah. It's like a prefab board that would yeah. auto-generate a certain amount of pieces. So the way I would design that, and I've actually never designed that before, is um, having the game store have an action that's like pre-populate board. And you would just give it a, an array of coordinates and like the pieces in those coordinates. Um, and you can create a different game type by reusing the same infrastructure in the same game but basically calling that before you start the game. Mm -hmm. Everything's there, I guess. Just mm -hmm. there. That's the power of having this library of functions that's like makes no assumption about the UI or the, the game mode you're in. They're almost infinitely reusable. So takeaways. The main takeaway is you learned how to build Tetris. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, uh, I think while fun, this talk has been really an amalgamation of a lot of my experience building web applications. And a few things that I've learned is, one, choosing the right data model and this right state representation is as core, as foundational as possible to application design. Choosing bad data models or choosing a bad way to represent your state makes your life so much harder in the future. And spending the time up front to really think about this and think about your use cases and think about you know, how you want things to interact goes such a long way in having a sustainable code base.
I've probably hit this one home more than once. Um, building core application logic <coughs> as a library of pure functions, it makes testing a breeze. It makes so many things nice. It makes your life better. Being able to compose, reuse, test these functions in a way where they're not coupled with anything is great. It's, it's how we should be building applications, and it's, it's how you can build them in JavaScript right now. You just have to think like that. A strong decoupling of application logic and state from the UI is best practice. So much of what we've done in Tetris isn't React. I don't think I coded any React in this demo. So what that means is we've now taken Tetris, built a library of functions and data models to solve the problem of building Tetris, and then we built a runtime for Tetris using Nuclear.js and Immutable.js that can be portable, that can be used anywhere. It can be used anywhere you can run JavaScript. We could very easily switch out React with, you know, name your favorite rendering engine. It could be done with um, Angular, it could be done with just plain jQuery, it could be done with plain HTML and creating a inner HTML string of the board and replacing it every time. It's probably not efficient, but it could be done. Decoupling mm -hmm. this means you're not only given portability, but you're given testability because it's so much easier to test things without a UI. I'm sure you've all run into this. As soon as code starts intermingling with UI, whether it's components or jQuery or the DOM, testing that becomes almost impossible. But if you can enforce a strong separation between your application logic and state and your UI, then you can test the parts that matter and then have the UI be very thin. So I think these are three good principles to take away from this and you can use in your everyday job, whether it's application design, whether it's website development, these are generally good software principles, and JavaScript is a great language to, to execute these in, as you've just seen. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope everyone had fun. If anyone would like to see the finished code of uh, the Tetris game we all programmed, you can look at Jordan Garcia slash Tetris. If anyone is interested in checking out the immutable Flux framework Nuclear.js, it's on Optimize's GitHub repo and open sourced. Thank you.